This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 852, recorded on January 11, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. Uh, the weather I would describe today as lame. <laughs> it's uh, 47 degrees, headed for 51 and overcast. Good day to be indoors doing TWIV. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everyone. And speaking of lame weather, <laughs> <laughs> um, it is 19 Fahrenheit, negative 7 Celsius here, although it is sunny. Uh, so definitely a good day to be inside doing TWIV. Yeah, it's sunny here, blue skies, but it is minus 7 Celsius here. And it was minus 9.5 about 7 a.m., so it hasn't gone up that much. Mm, boy, that just doesn't sound comfortable at it's all. It's cold. What was, the, what was the low in Buffalo? What would it get down to, Rich? Uh, I, you know, there were a couple of days that were minus 20 Fahrenheit, but that was rare, okay? It would, uh, it would you know, hover around freezing for weeks on end. So that's minus 29 Celsius. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's very cold. Oh, it's yeah, that, that was very rare. It's very warm right now in Buffalo. It's 15 uh, Fahrenheit. Very warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 15 okay. Fahrenheit sounds about right. Uh, we have a couple of public service announcements. Actually, one, basically, or all... Uh, revolving around the annual meeting of the American Society for Virology 2022, which is going to happen this summer in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I plan to go uh, and do a TWIV there. The abstract deadline is March 1st, 2022. Travel award applications, that means if you want some assistance from ASV to help pay for your travel, those applications are due on March Third, however, if you're a global scholar, uh, those are due February one, which is coming up. Uh, global scholars, you can apply for travel money, or you can uh, f apply to remotely attend the online portion of the meeting, which I guess costs some money. So you can apply for a grant, and that the online part includes the plenary sessions, state of the art lectures, and the satellite symposia. Now, if you are uh, going to apply for travel money, you have to join ASV, of course, because, uh, well, they won't even consider it if you're not a member. And anyway, if they gave it to you, you'd have to be a member to attend the meeting. Okay, you see all these issues here? <laughs> so uh, join now. Go over to ASV.org, and there's a place where you can join. Uh, and then uh, you, you to, tr to apply for your travel award, ASV.org slash ASV2022 slash asv dash travel-awards or asv.org slash asv2022 and look for the registration tab, okay? Uh, I have a couple of comments on this. First of all, this bit about registration is, uh, from the point of view of ASV administration, really annoying because people, you know, go to try and get a travel award or, in fact, submit an abstract or want to give a talk and they aren't registered and it's at the last minute and so you got to chase them around and get them registered. Don't do that, man. <laughs> just, uh, just, just uh, do your membership. Okay? I, re Get it all I renewed done. mine last night. In fact, there you go. Get it all done. It's not difficult. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the travel awards are uh, plentiful. Right? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, take advantage of that. You know, you can yes. get assistance to go to ASV. Yes, this is their main activity. This yeah. meeting, and they do a good job. Yeah. Now, uh, Rich, are you planning to go? Uh, yeah, it's uh, on my calendar. Good. How about you, Brienne? It's on my calendar as well. We need to uh, decide who we're going to have on TWIV. I haven't looked at the uh, the, the uh, schedule of talks. I think we ought to get this jackalope on TWIV. <laughs> we should get the jackalope on TWIV. I, I actually have a – when I, I do a lecture on transformation and oncogenesis in my virology course, and I show a picture of a jackalope um, because it makes for a good story. Man. Anyway, we'll, we'll tell you what a jackalope is. <laughs> Our paper is an article in Cell, 
Humans with inherited T-cell CD28 deficiency are susceptible to skin papillomaviruses, but are otherwise healthy. And this is a very cool paper. It's the only thing we're going to do today besides maybe some email. Um, it's just huge. And there are a ton of authors. In fact, they can't fit them all on the first page of the <laughs> paper. I've never seen that before. Never That's seen amazing. That before. Author list continued on the next page. And the other thing is, so for example, they'll go, if you go to the next page, they'll have like the superscript 30. These authors contributed equally. And then there are more than, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people with the superscript of 30, okay? Yeah, so they're all co-second author. That's right, because the first author, Vivian Beziat, is all, all by herself. Uh, and then, the thing is, though, then they have superscript 31, and there are a bunch of them, and I guess those are co-third authors, right? I guess. And then they have superscript 32, 33, and 34. And then they have a lead contact, Jean-Laurent Casanova, who's right here in New York at Rockefeller University. And then they have correspondence, the first author, Vivian Bezia and Jean-Laurent Casanova. So it is quite a consortium. And if you're wondering where they're from, they're from Thomas Jefferson. Well, I actually have to start on the first page. Paris, New York. Philadelphia, Australia, Iran, because uh, these patients are from Iran. Uh, Bethesda, Canada, UK. Canada, Germany, uh, Belgium. Japan. It's just an amazing consortium. Yeah, this is pretty typical of a lot of the papers from um, Casanova's lab. That's right, that's um, right. He tends to look at um, genetic uh, issues leading to changes in immune responses. Um, and so he's identified a lot of um, genetic susceptibility uh, information regarding uh, genetic susceptibility to different infections. If it, we've done a couple of uh, papers from this group before mm -hmm. on TWIB. Um, well, this one is extremely cool. So this is about human papillomaviruses. Um these are small, icosahedral, double-stranded, circular DNA-containing uh, viruses uh, that, uh, that infect cutaneous keratinocytes, and they cause a, a number of different kinds of lesions on your skin, flat and common warts, okay? If you've ever had a wart, it's got a virus in it, uh, and they say your common warts are typically caused by, and there are a lot of papillomaviruses, right? They're a human Human papillomas. There are also papillomaviruses of other animals as well, as you will hear. Uh, I think over 150 or so. Yeah. And a couple, you know, and a subset of those are uh, uh, sexually transmitted and can cause uh, anogenital cancers, for example. Um, and we vaccinate against those, but many of them cause uh, warts on your skin, flat warts and common warts. Uh, HPV two and four, they say, are typically viruses involved in common warts. Uh, and these are in the population. They're, they're quite widespread. They're typically localized uh, and benign. But in certain patients that have T-cell immunodeficiencies, uh, they can do other things. And one of them is called a cutaneous horn. Protrusions of keratotic material uh, various shapes and sizes that can arise from a single wart. They can be giant, they can be disseminated, and the severe form is called tree man syndrome. They are uh, grouped. Se severe hyperkeratotic cutaneous papillomatosis. That's the medical term. Or you could say tree man syndrome, and actually they abbreviate it in the paper as TMS. Um, only four <laughs> cases of TMS that are unrelated have been reported. Uh, and it looks like HPV2, which is a common cause of, uh, is a cause of common warts, um, was the cause of three of these four cases. So this is an exceedingly rare disease, but it's very easy to find because, I mean, the, the papillomas are huge. These patients can be covered with them. Um, they seem to predominate in the pictures that I've seen on the hands and feet. 
Yeah. But they can occur yeah. uh, elsewhere as well. And they just like take over these people's hands and feet. It's a, a very, it's an unfortunate pathology. It's very striking pathology too. Yeah. Uh, so you can look up tree man syndrome and you'll get in images of it. And it's the, I just love, you know, in, uh, in rabbits, there's this papilloma virus that shows up with a similar sort of um, yeah. phenotype. And you've got this picture here, Vincent, that I hope shows <laughs> up on the uh, episode because it's, it's striking this poor widow bunny rabbit. And <laughs> a big horn sticking yeah, out all over his bummer. head and face. And um, yeah, those, those, those are caused by uh, rabbit papilloma viruses and, Cottontail rabbit papillomavirus, which was discovered in the 1930s, first DNA, uh, oncogenic DNA virus discovered by Shope, Robert Shope. And um, so these rabbits in the wild have these horns. And I think if you've ever heard of a jackalope, which is a mythical cross between a jackrabbit and an antelope, I think this is a jackalope. Yeah. People see these rabbits with big horns. It looks like, it looks like uh, horns. <laughs> they say, ah, oh. <laughs> but I think it's just rabbits with papillomas. And, you know, these, these rabbits, they fall off pretty much. They go away. Um, the rabbits are fine. They don't, they're not harmed by them. So um, back to human uh, TMS. Wait, wait, I want to do one more, yeah, uh, yeah. one more bit of history. He does it in the, they do it in the introduction here. But, yeah. Um, it was studying the, <clears throat> cotton rabbit papilloma virus where that was one of the first demonstrations of a filterable agent that is a virus causing a pathology like this in particular a cancer so that's right what's well, one of the historic experiments in that's right virology so the first uh tumor viruses were rna viruses and then this was the first dna tumor virus and i didn't realize this but peyton rouse worked on these in mm -hmm. 1934 because he, remember, he he discovered Rouse sarcoma virus in 1906, but he left it because nobody believed him, or very few people believed him, so he left it. And then he, he came back in the 30s and, and uh, started working on these uh, rapid papilloma virus. And as Dixon outlined in, I believe, the last episode, Rouse was adamant in pushing the notion that viruses yeah. cause cancer, which is true in some cases. I think you can... Uh, hold viruses responsible for as much as twenty percent of of human cancers, but um, it's not it's not everything. Okay, so he over pushed it, but he was right, and nobody was paying any attention. So the rabbit story, what Rouse found is that uh, you can inject filtrate, a cell free filtrate, and cause warts. Uh, Sixty five percent of the rabbits have persistent warts, and some of them become horns. And 25% of those go on to develop cancers of internal organs within about a year. And they say that in 1991, now fast forward many years later, in New Zealand white rabbits, which are outbred rabbits, the persistence of skin lesions segregated with MHC class 2 genes. So they said inadequate CD4 positive T cell immunity is somehow involved uh, in these, uh, these rabbit papillomavirus lesions. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why this this group looked uh, in patients because they said maybe there's a T cell immunodeficiency in the tree man syndrome. And my understanding is that the, uh, this is all relevant to all of our discussions on immunology of SARS-CoV-2 and other things. But my, my understanding is that uh, generally it's thought that T cell immunity is sort of uh, essential if the the front line in dealing with warts the humoral right. immune response the antibody response is not all that robust uh, and doesn't correlate well with protection as I understand it um, and uh, it's the T cell response that's really um, uh, important and the irony of that is to me is that the vaccine induces a huge antibody response. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, and and that uh, that basically prevents uh, infection. That's the one we've talked about so often as uh, conferring sterilizing immunity. Okay, yeah. I, we ought to 
sometime review that and see how good the evidence is for uh, sterilizing immunity. But this is a, a great example to me of how you can fool your immune system, okay? <laughs> Manipulate it to uh, fight off a creature in a fashion that it ordinarily wouldn't do. Yes, that the immune response that results in clearing a microbe and the immune response that stops the microbe from coming in in the first place don't have to be the same. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, I was thinking about this uh, uh, as, I, uh, as I was reading the paper. So warts are essentially benign tumors, mm -hmm. right? Right. I think uh, so, yeah. And the, the virus uh, gets into the basal cells of the uh, epithelium uh, and uh, replicates its DNA, and there are um, uh, genes that the virus has that induce uh, cellular DNA replication uh, to create an environment that's, I mean, anthropo uh, anthropo anthropomorphized. Yeah, anthropomorphizing, whatever. Okay, create an environment that's conducive for the virus replication. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but. It's not, uh, those cells migrate up and differentiate, and it's not until the upper layers of this structure, this wart structure in the epithelium, uh, that the late genes that encode capsid proteins are turned on, and you make virus, okay? So most of the business of a wart is not about making virus and reinfecting cells, it's about virus DNA replication stimulating and virus gene expression stimulating cellular uh, proliferation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I haven't quite put it all together yet where I can articulate it correctly, but it seems to me to make, uh, to make sense that the T cell response would be the appropriate way to take care of that as opposed to the humoral response. Am I making sense, Brianne? You are... Jeez. I'm not sure that I can exactly articulate what you mean either. <laughs> um, but I think the important thing in a tumor is to get rid of the cells that are replicating the DNA, and it has very little to do with uh, mature virus. Right. And so the idea here right. is that right. so much of that wart is made up of cells that are apparently proliferating. Yeah. And so you need to actually get rid of those apparently proliferating cells. Right. And it's not so much about virus particles. Right. You could neutralize a virus all day long and it wouldn't do anything for the wart. Right. Yeah. In fact, once you establish, it, it, not necessarily in warts, but in other, in HPV tumors, there's no more virus often. It's just a few genes that are left behind and that's causing the cells to proliferate and eventually become uh, a tumor. In fact, the E6 and E7 genes of uh, these papillomaviruses drive the cell to divide so that the viral DNA can be re reproduced because it needs to depend on the host's ma machinery. And the, if the host is not dividing, it's nowhere. So it encodes proteins that drive the cell into mitosis. And in, in rare cases, uh, those genes get integrated into the cell and the cell doesn't die. And there you have a tumor. It keeps the cells keep dividing and they sustain mutations and eventually they become a tumor. And that's what happened with uh, Henrietta Lacks, right? She had HPV 18 integrate is HeLa cells, which are derived from her, have HPV 18, E6 and E7 genes integrated. Nothing else, just those two. And that's enough to have immortalized those cells. It's really amazing. <laughs> but that's different from a wart. Those are uh, cervical tumors. So there is some previous evidence that T cells are involved in, in fact, there are some other um, uh, papillomavirus diseases where T cells are, are involved. And then the rabbits where the lesions, are, they say, are strikingly reminiscent of the tree man lesions. And there it's a T cell thing. So that's that gave them some uh, idea here. But one more thing that's interesting is they say the rarity and lack of contagiousness of TMS is amaz is intriguing because... HPV2 is is ubiquitous, right? So why don't mm -hmm. more people get TMS? Uh, but very few do. And so uh, that's the that's where we're coming from here. And and there are three patients, three uh, a um, a patient with three relatives. And I want to go through their case histories actually briefly because it's really interesting. And and they don't do it in the actual body of the paper. So we have to scroll down to the uh, methods. Uh, so let me just get through it because there are a lot of figures in this paper. I'm still scrolling. I'm still scrolling. Now I hit the tables where they list all their reagents. 
<laughs> I'm still scrolling. Man, I'm glad I don't have to do this anymore. The documentation on the methods is just crazy. I mean, uh, each crazy. crimer is listed. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Here we go. Uh, subject detail. So, P1, patient one, is a 30-year-old Iranian man with tree man syndrome. Lives in Iran. For eight, for eight years of life, he was fine. And then from eight years on, he progressively developed common warts, which eventually entirely covered his hands and feet. At 22 years, these horns began to develop on top of the warts over a few months. You know, they tried to get rid of them, but it didn't help. He was a dry, he was a truck driver, a driver, they say. Uh, he weighed 60 kilograms until he was 24, and then he started losing weight, and he currently weighs 45 kilograms. And part of the part of that is he developed a drug habit, which is uh, yeah. I can understand. Yeah. Uh, with the exception of a cousin who's patient two and his daughter, who was patient three in this study, no other members of his family have susceptibility to the warts. Uh, the patient has a history of atopic dermatitis and diabetes in his mother, allergic rhinitis in some sisters and brother. And so um, HPV, multiplex PCR showed HPV2 to be the only cutaneous papillomavirus present in the warts. Um, there's traces of HPV3 and 4, but mostly HPV2. And they did sequencing in this paper to confirm that. Okay. All so right. patient one and patient two are cousins. Cousins, that's right. There, I, and I spent a lot of time on this family tree, which is majorly confusing. There, uh, patient one and patient two, if I read this correctly, their fathers were brothers. Yep. And patient three is the daughter of patient two. Patient two, two right. And, and right, so one thing I'll also to say, if we look back at everything Vincent just told us about patient one, um, one of the things that will come back to be striking to me later on is that if we look at this, you know, there's some mention of some other health issues in patient one um, in terms of some food allergies and asthma um, and a few other infections. But, you know, he is at... Uh, you know, his medical history until eight was unremarkable. Um, he right. was this 30-year-old 30, 30 man. You don't hear about, you know, influenza issues or right. Right. Um, huge numbers of other uh, infections, um, either of, of any type, bacterial, viral, fungal. Um, and so, you know, this doesn't strike you strike me as a dramatic immunodeficiency. Exactly. Um, from this That's right. uh, description. That's right. All right, so P2 is a 40-year-old cousin of P1, developed his first warts at 10 years of age. They spread until they entirely covered his hands and feet, but he did not develop cutaneous horns. At 20 years of age, they started to disappear, and they were gone in two years. He had a little dispigmentation left, but um, he had two warts left. These were removed and showed to have HPV4 uh, in them. So that's... Virologically different than patient one, right? Patient one had HPV two. That's patient right. two had HPV four. Both associated uh, with common warts, usually, That's but right. they are different HPVs. Um, and again, these uh, no marked susceptibility to other infections. Never been hospitalized. They, you know, these patients all had EBV, which is typical CMV, but that's not unusual. We all do. Uh, and patient three is the 12-year-old daughter of patient two, began to develop warts at the age of eight years and currently has 15 warts on her hands. And uh, HPV4 is the causative virus of those. No particular susceptibility to other infections, no allergies, no asthma, has never been uh, hospitalized, has EBV. So the three patients are otherwise healthy, resistant to most other microbes, no mucocutaneous, uh, no other viral infections, no flat warts, no molluscum contagiosum, no laryngeal or anogenital warts. Just these skin warts, and in the one case, the horns. So that's the, and these are all, I guess they're all in Iran. Yeah. And so yeah. that's, uh, you know, there's a component of the authorship from there. All right, so what do you do? You take, first thing you do is you 
take the uh, genome of these patients, which is relatively easy to get, and you do some sequencing. And uh, you, you can do it in a number of ways. They do single nucleotide polymorphism uh, analysis um, to see you know, what single nucleotide changes they have. The three, three patients, they have 13 relatives that they can use for comparison, which is really nice. So the idea is there's an autosomal recessive trait with complete penetrance, okay? Um, and they found linkage of a specific part of chromosome two with this trait, this uh, the wart trait. Um, and within the linked region, which is pretty big, they found three protein coding genes, including CD28, <laughs> the gene encoding CD28. And this is where we cue Brianne to give us a brief <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was right, I was right. <laughs> on CD28. Um, yes, and this is where immunologists' ears perk up <laughs> uh, quite a bit. Um, so CD28 is a uh, very well-known protein in immunology. It is on T cells, and it is uh, sort of canonically known as the protein that gives T cells signal two. Um, so when you want to turn on a T cell, the T cell needs to get signal one and signal two. Um, the, the first signal is from the T cell receptor. It is from the antigen, in this case, the virus. And the CD28 um, ligand um, is also being made by the infected cell. And it's really kind of ma being made by that infected cell at the same time as a result of that cell having been infected. Um, this is a whole area of immunology with some debate that I won't get into, but there are some people who would call, say that the cell has sensed danger uh, in, with this infection, um, has sensed some kind of danger signal and has put this additional protein um, on its surface in order to turn on the T cell um, and give it, sig give it this signal too. Um, so the, the antigen presenting cell makes, um, uh, it's called B7 or it's called CD80 or 86 Um and that fully lets the T cell get turned on and sort of, you know, all the textbooks say this is this is how you turn on all your naive T cells is that they have to get signal one and signal two. And so the idea that there's something wrong with CD28 um, rings a lot of alarm bells that there might be something wrong with turning on T cells. Uh, OK, so <clears throat> I now have about a thousand questions. So. Okay. <laughs> Uh, one of the take-home messages from this paper that we're going to get to is that these people are uh, messed up in CD28, and by and large, they're okay, except for these warts. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that signal two is uh, mm, usually irrelevant, or are there other ways to trigger signal two? So there are a whole bunch of proteins that are sort of related <clears throat> different family members. And so what this says to me is that some of those other proteins can be just as important as CD28 um, in turning on naive T cells. Okay, so, and they, so they get a little bit at sort of CD4 versus CD8 T cells later in the paper. So there's going to be a lot of redundancy in this particular function. CD28 is, is one of these. Right. And that... It makes a lot of sense. We see this in lots of places in immunology. And in fact, we see this in lots of uh, papers from the Casanova lab that there is a fair amount of redundancy in the immune system because if there wasn't, um, we would all suffer quite a bit um, from different microbes trying to mess with immune responses. So the other question is, does the CD28 ligand that's made mm -hmm. by the infected cell that you mm -hmm. uh, talked about, uh, is that mm, turned on uh, through some sort of innate pathway? And does it have any function other than being a uh, signal two ligand? Um, so it is turned on through an innate pathway. Um, so um, some of the same things that are turning on your inflammatory cytokines and things like that are also turning on uh, the production of uh, the signal two protein. Um, depends on which one we're talking about in terms of other functions. Um, but there are a couple uh, of famous ones. One in particular has to do with um, turning off some other kinds of immune responses. Okay. But these are 
generally immune modulators of some sort. Yes, or absolutely. Okay, they absolutely. aren't, you know, uh, you know, doing, uh, um, you know, neurological signal transduction or some other totally unrelated task. No, these are really thought of as immune signal modulators. In fact, the Nobel Prize that was given in medicine a couple of years ago for checkpoint therapy was um, one so partially for anti-CD28 antibodies. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it, it involved the CD28 pathway. The other was part was for PD-1. So. Cool. So uh, this 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 family, these three individuals, they have a a single nucleotide change in the last nucleotide of exon one. So the the pre mRNA is spliced that has exons which are going to end up in the mRNA, and then introns which are removed. So the last nucleotide of that first exon, it's a single base change from G to A. It's predicted to replace codon number 18, which is the glycine in the last position of the signal peptide. <laughs> signal peptide is removed, of course, from the protein, so it's not even going to be there in the mature protein. And it's replaced um, uh, glycine to arginine. All right. This variant is also predicted to disrupt the donor site for splicing between exons 1 and 2. So not only is it changing an amino acid, it's going to mess up splicing of the pre-mRNA. Now, and we're going to get back to that. They, they say now the segregation of this change, uh, this variant, is completely consistent with a fully penetrant autosomal recessive trait. If you look at uh, the family, it makes sense. But there are only five <laughs> homozygous missense CD28 variants in public databases of all the human sequences that you can access, and there are a lot, there are only five homozygous CD28 missense uh, variants, and they go through them. Two of them are neutral, um, uh, and the others are not. So they also show <laughs> in this paper, if you knock out CD28 gene in mice, they are vulnerable to murine. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, mus musculus papillomavirus 1. So I, I think they did that just for this paper, right? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, they got enough authors. That's supplementary. Cool. Yeah, that was my impression. <laughs> it's supplementary figure 2. So, I mean, that supports the idea that this change is somehow responsible for this uh, phenotype that we're looking at. So they say, okay, so the CD8 deficiency is very rare in the general population, and in this kindred, it seems to be highly associated with causing disease. So let's figure out what it's doing, right? So first they look at what the, the single nucleotide polymorphism does. So as Brienne told you, CD28 uh, is a transmembrane protein uh, on the surface of cells. So they look at the mRNA levels in cells um, by reverse transcription and PCR. And, by, uh, and T cells from the patients that have been expanded in culture. CD28 mRNAs are 150 to 200 fold lower in T cells from the patients than in, than in controls. Uh, and they do have some heterozygous cells, right? Some of these relatives are heterozygous. Uh, the, the levels are half of control, which is about what you would expect, right? Um, and they do a, <clears throat> a number of studies. Um, to, to validate this, they, they look at the, the, the effect of the splice sites and so forth. And basically, they find that the, these cells that make aberrant transcripts, uh, which they think are destroyed by a normal cellular system that would get rid of aberrant transcripts and not keep them around, right? And that's what is probably responsible for the decreased mRNA levels in those cells. So they say the variant, the single nucleotide change at the end of exon 1, strongly decreases mRNA levels in the T cells from these patients, probably by, this is called nonsense media de decay of the two aberrant transcripts that would be produced by the splicing problem caused by this change. That's, that's so cool. I mean, that's like a paper in itself. Yeah. And I, I was a little confused here for a while. I just, just now, live on the show, figured it out. <laughs> um, 
by the uh, observation that uh, in the patient, mm-hmm. uh, there's uh, of the uh, RNAs that they can recover and sequence, 80% of them are spli- spliced properly. Right. And 20% of them have these uh, aberrant splices that <clears throat> give rise to frame shifts, nonsense mutations, nonsense media decay. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, if 80% of these are spliced properly, how come there's this great reduction in RNA? Well, it, the 80% are the 80% of the RNAs that are left. Yes. Right. The ones that are left manage to get spri- spliced properly, but that's not enough to make enough CD28. Okay. Exactly. And, and I will admit that I was confused uh, for a while when I was reading the paper about how we got from um, parts F and G, which we've been talking about, to the later parts. Um, and I had to spend some time thinking about, oh, wait, how would you actually set up that experiment later on? Um, because I was, I had some confusion about how they moved from the mRNA issues to protein in the next part of this. All right. So then they <clears throat> say, do the transcripts from this variant, do they make functional CD28? <clears throat> so they make DNA copies of the various CD28 uh, mRNAs and put them into HEC-293 cells to see, to see the protein, to, to be able to see whether the protein is made or not. And they use antibodies uh, to detect them. All right, so uh, the wild-type protein, and then they have the glycine to arginine and then they have a, another, two other isoforms that are uh, found by aberrant splicing in these patients. <clears throat> so the wild type, of course, DNA, you get the protein made in cells. Uh, the glycine 18 arginine isoforms, you get the same, you get also the protein made in cells. But they don't get the two other variant proteins made. Um, so, it, so they say the, these have premature stop codons in them. And so they, they assume that the translation stops and that's it there. So the gliarginine isoform, where they see the protein in the cell, the last amino acid of the sig- signal peptide is, infect- is affected, which they would predict would relocate the signal peptide cleavage site without impairing protein trafficking. Uh, and they find normal amounts of that protein on the surface of the cell compared to the wild-type protein. Of course, the, the other two variants are not detected because those are prematurely, uh, translationally stopped. So they're wondering if this single amino acid change in the signal peptide somehow affects the the primary structure uh, of the protein on the cell surface. And so they ask whether it works in the the signaling pathway that Brienne mentioned earlier. Um, They say, if we um, add an antibody to CD28, that's going to initiate this signaling pathway. And they look for one of the steps of this pathway, which is phosphorylation of a subunit of NF-kappa B. So NF-kappa B, I presume, Brienne, is downstream of CD28, right? Yes, it is. And they can see phosphorylation of this subunit, and they look for it. Wild type, of course, they see it. And they also see it with the glycine variant. They get the right downstream phosphorylation. So basically, the idea here is that you get very low levels of this protein because of that change. Um. It's, the protein seems to be okay. It works, but there's not very much of it, and that probably is part of the problem in these patients. Yeah, so if anyone was confused like me here, um, the, the, trick, <laughs> the trick is that in the um, experiments where they're looking at the protein, they are um, setting up a system where they're making sure that they have the same amount of either the wild type or the gly 18 arch transcript. Right. And they're showing when you have the same amount of those transcripts, you get the same amount of protein and the protein works just fine. The issue is that they showed us earlier in the patients, you don't have the same amount of those transcripts. In the patients, you're making these three different transcripts, um, some of which are getting degraded. The ones that are degraded don't make functional protein, which is shown. Um, and the, but the other one, if it were present at the same level, would make the same protein. And so they're, you know, not looking specifically at the patient cells and at the amount of transcript that happens in the patient cells here. Um, They're sort of looking at what if you had the same amount of that protein. Right, right. So it's an artificial situation because they got plenty of mRNA made from their vector. Exactly. Just a little, little footnote here. 
the cells that they're, the cultured cells that they're doing these in are uh, HEC-293 cells. Mm -hmm. That's human embryo, embryonic kidney 293 cells. These are the things that have been around in culture for 50 years mm -hmm. that uh, are uh, used for production of the adenovirus-based vaccines or derivative are used for the production of the adenovirus-based vaccines and have been used in some of the preliminary preclinical experiments for the mRNA uh, vaccines and the uh, anti-vax crowd uh, gets all uh, excited about the notion that aborted fetuses are used to make vaccines. Uh, I just want to make the point that once again, that these have been in culture forever and they are widely used uh, in uh, laboratories uh, and because they're really great cells to do this kind of stuff with. And here they show up again. Yep. And, we, and in many of the SARS-CoV-2 papers we've talked about, these are used yeah. to produce protein for various experiments. Yeah. All right. So what about in T cells? <clears throat> they wanted to look at the, the functionality of, of CD28 in T cells. So they get CD4 and CD8 positive T cells from these patients in this cohort. <clears throat> they put them in culture. They expand them. No surface CD8 by flow cytometry is found from CD28. the CD28 is found from the three CD28 deficient patients. And they have some heterozygous patients in this cohort. Again, they have 50% of the levels because they have one wild type gene, right? And then they said, okay, what about functionally? If we had an antibody to CD28, do we see this phosphorylation of the NF kappa B subunit downstream? Basically, the patients have no detectable phosphorylation following adding the antibody to CD28. But if they put in the DNA encoding the wild type CD28 into those cells from the patients, that gets to the surface and, and it works. If you add antibodies to it, it's, it, it's, it uh, turns on the phosphorylation of the NF-kappa B subunit. All right, so the, the mutant allele in these patients, you get very low levels of mRNA, which they say potentially encoding a functional isoform. Um, but um, the cells have no functional activity as far as CD828 goes. So, Brianne, uh, at this point uh, in the paper and subsequently, they, uh, in looking at CD8 presence and function on T cells, mm -hmm. they uh, separate out CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells and uh, do those independently. Yes. Uh, why? Um, because... They uh, know from some previous literature, and they actually show quite nicely here as well, that perhaps um, that signal to you might differ a little bit between CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. So maybe only CD4s or only CD8s need it, not both. Okay. Um, and so if they kept all of the T cells together, they might sort of wash out their signal. Um, if ah, okay, in particular. Okay, great. Right. I, I could separate them out even further, could I not? You you could separate them out even further, particularly among the CD4s. Um, and they talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. later on. Um, but in particular with some of the past literature that they cite here, um, they talk about past questions about CD4 being dependent on CD28 versus CD8 maybe being less so. Okay, good. All right, so the next section they say, all right, so CD, when CD28 is bound by its ligand, then uh, there, there are events that happen, and one of them we just talked about, the phosphorylation of a subunit of NF-kappa B, and then, of course, NF-kappa B turns on the transcription of further downstream genes, so they wanted to see uh, wh what was going on there. And uh, basically, the... <clears throat> Which is very interesting, and maybe you, you can explain this. So if you take wild-type cells and you stimulate CD28 and CD2, I'm not sure why CD2, brand is that one of these other co-stimulatory? Um, I think of CD2 as a, an um, adhesion molecule, but I think okay. it can lead to some stimulation. Okay, so if they let's just focus on CD28. Yeah. If they stimulate CD28, even in wild-type cells, you only get a few genes 
uh, turned on. They look at, they do transcriptome sequencing. And that few genes are completely gone in the patient cells, which you would guess, because there's no functional CD28 uh, on the surface. And then they look in more distal. So they're more distal to those immediate genes turned on, right? There's a whole cascade of, mm -hmm. of gene expression happening. And all of that is abolished. Um, and the conclusion here is that consistent with the proximal signaling impairment downstream of CD28, right? There's no CD28. More distal responses are also abolished. So, Yeah, well, the, the other thing that's really important is if you look at this figure, they've got, they're comparing um, cells stimulated with CD3 plus CD2 and versus CD3 plus CD28. And if you mm -hmm. look at the cells from the patient, um, you get a, you know, you have less stimulation when they do CD3, CD2 compared yeah. to the, the controls, but it's not like dramatically a different pattern. If you just look at that heat map, the reds are about in the same place. Yeah, the greens yeah. are about in the same place. And if you look at CD3 plus CD28, that patient looks really different. There are places where there should be red or green, yeah. um, you know, for changes in uh, gene expression. That's just not happening in the patient. And so that kind of also tells us that this isn't a general problem with signaling in right, the cells right, from this patient. Right. It's specific to the signaling that's happening with CD3 and 28. Right. So wait a minute. Did we already talk about this? Uh, the relevance of CD three in this? Uh, we did no, not. But we, we did can. not. No. Uh, can you? Yeah. Sure. Fill me in. Uh, so CD three is um, part of the T cell receptor complex, um, and if you use an antibody against CD three, it basically fakes out the T cell to tell it that it got a TCR sim signalization. And so sig CD three is giving signal one. Uh -huh. CD twenty eight is giving signal two. Okay. So um, CD3 uh, is, is intact in these patients. T so cell, right? I don't know if they do this uh, later on, but what would happen if they don't do, in these experiments, they don't do CD28 alone? Yeah, CD28 doesn't seem to have a big change in some of these without the CD3 co uh, co-ligation. Okay, so and so from that point of view, CD2 is just kind of a control. Exactly. Right. Ah, oh, boy, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so next, they looked at leukocyte subsets in the blood uh, of these three patients. Um, so is there some broad impact on leukocyte? So leukocyte subsets are all fine. Uh, myeloid cells, monocytes, and dendritic cells seem to be normal. Uh, B cell subsets and frequencies are normal. Class switch memory B cells are normal and K cells were low and they go into some other cell types. And I don't think we need to go through all of these. There's quite a bit of work uh, being done here, but they basically conclude that the distribution and function of various leukocyte subsets were normal or subnormal in the three patients. Uh, and that, which they think is probably why they don't get any other infections uh, other than this, because they can deal with them. Right. Yeah. And so that, um, that is sort of the general numbers of a lot of these leukocyte subsets. Um, they talk a little bit as they go forward into thinking about different kinds of T cells. But in terms of generally with different leukocytes, they don't have big differences. Now, the next part I found really cool. <laughs> Somatic mosaicism in, in the CD4 positive memory T cells. So they looked at CD28 in the various T cell subsets from these patients. And again, no CD28 on naive circulating CD4 and CD8 cells or on memory CD8 cells, but a small fraction of memory CD4 T cells of P3, P1, and P2, those are the three patients, had low levels of CD28, 0 0.8, 2.1%, and 2.9%. And so they say this was similar to those in the heterozygotes, but lower than for the controls. So they're thinking maybe one allele, one CD28 allele reverted. It's only a single base change, right? And our polymerases make mistakes. They don't correct them all, so that it can happen. <laughs> and um, so they did... Um, they looked at CD28 positive T cells by sorting, and some of the cells are heterozygous for the variant, whereas the null cells were homozygous. So they could actually see that 
there's some um, cells where the, the change is not present any longer, that G to A change. And so that, that yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that change, of course, restores normal splicing, and therefore you get the protein on the surface. But it's a very small fraction of the cells that are like this. Right. But the, remember that the fraction of if a cell suddenly starts to make CD28, right. where it wasn't before, it can now get signal two. It can right. now uh, phosphorylate that NF kappa B subunit. And one yeah. of the biggest things that a, a T cell does when it gets signal two is it proliferates. Right. Um, and so you can sort of imagine that this is a selective advantage in that rare cell that happens to have the reversion mutation. Now that cell has sort of the selective advantage if it happens to see its antigen, um, then it's going to divide and you might be able to detect some of its progeny because those progeny have had such a selective advantage. But this is not enough to take care of their papillomatosis, no. right? right. So why doesn't it, why don't these cells take over and proliferate? Well, so you could imagine that, say there's one in a thousand, I just made that number up, right. of the T cells that have this reversion. That's going to be random. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be in a T cell. And it would be amazing if they lucked out that it happened to be a T cell that recognized a papilloma antigen. I see. But most likely, it's in a T cell that recognizes, I don't know, yeah, an something influenza else, yeah. antigen or something yeah. else. Okay. So, so, those t <laughs> so you're not going to look out sort of that it's the one T cell that makes the mutation is also responding to that antigen. It's just that these T cells maybe are going to get a little bit of signals in other situations to respond. Okay. Okay. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Um, and they also say these... They showed that the cells were autologous, not maternally derived. So what does that mean? Um, so you could imagine that there may be a few cells that may be coming from mom, um, particularly uh, at birth. Um, and maybe, again, you had a couple cells from mom can't, uh, come in at birth. And again, those cells may have had some amazing selective advantage. <laughs> and stuck around. Um, and so they're showing, no, these are not uh, cells that came that way. Those, these are cells that actually were revertants in the patient. So this is uh, full of stuff that I just don't understand, but they say this, <laughs> I mean, I just, they, I, I, the conclusion is a 1,500-fold expansion of revertant cells between the recent thymic emigrants, those are the T cells who have left the thymus recently, uh, and um, memory CD4 positive T cells, 1500 fold expansion, right? Right. And they say they're phenotypically diverse. So um, they're different subsets, I guess, right? Yes. Um, so I found this really cool that there's a little of reversion event that they can um, and they say the, the, these reversion events were highly diverse. These T cells are highly diverse in terms of their T cell receptor and functional repertoire. They occurred in the three patients following at least two types of somatic mutation. So is this, um, Brand, is this found often or is it not really studied all that much? Is, is, so when you say this, what do you mean uh, by The this? reversion <laughs> of, of a, say, a, a, a SNP in the, in in the immune system? Um, I don't know of many examples, but I, I think the only way you would ever find them is if they happened to provide the cell with that kind of selective advantage that we're seeing yeah. here. And so here you have to find these patients who have this SNP. These patients have to get exposed to these papillomaviruses and have this outcome, and you then you have to find them and do whole genome sequencing on them. Okay. So, Brienne, if it turned out that the revertin occurred in a T cell that was specific for the viral for a viral epitope, would they then expand and get rid of the infection? Yeah, my guess is you wouldn't ever find that person. Yeah, uh, because they wouldn't have a phenotype. They wouldn't have a phenotype. <laughs> so maybe a lot of these cases are prevented by it, right? Or it's too, it's that, too that low seems frequency. Too, that seems 
too rare. Yes. Okay. Got it. So uh, I'm trying to imagine uh, where in the lineage of T cells this reversion is happening. Okay, so okay. this is not a germline reversion. No. Or otherwise, otherwise you'd be 100% reverted, right? Or mm -hmm. at least uh, 50% uh, heterozygote, okay? So, uh, and I know nothing about uh, uh, T-cell differentiation, but there must be a population of what are effectively stem cells from which uh, other cells are derived and some... Uh, some cell or cells in that population, there must be a pool that sticks around where the reversion happens. What's in your head relative to that, Brianne? Um, so in my head, it's the thing that you would need to do to fully address some of that is to look and see if you were seeing that reversion in B cells. Okay. So is it in all lymphocytes? Did okay. it happen before the lymphocyte or is it only in T cells? Okay. Is it in all the CD4s Okay. and CD8s or just one? Um, you know, they talk a little bit here about whether it's in the recent thymic immigrants, um, which are the cells that have not yet been activated or those who've been activated, but you need CD28 to get activated. So that complicates things. Um, so I would... Say you would have to do a, you know, you might have to look at a million B cells to see is there are there B cells with this, revert, you know, but reversion. presumably it's in uh, somewhere along the the lineage. It's in some right. sort of a precursor that sticks around and and keeps giving rise to a certain population of these, right? Right. I guess the other question is, yeah, I I don't know. Okay. I was trying to imagine if it could be happening multiple times. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't I, know. Okay, fine. So the next thing they did is ask, what is the antibody response in these patients like? Because they noticed in their CD28 knockout mice, they make low levels of IgG antibody in response to immunization with peptides or viruses. But and this would be expected because CD4 cells are really important for helping B cells make those antibody responses. Right. However, the patients have normal Ig classes, the various classes of Ig, and normal IgG subclasses, and they have antibodies against a variety of pathogens, like in herpes viruses, influenza viruses, various bacteria, pneumococcus, Haemophilus. Um, they did a number of different techniques, including VIRSCAN, which we've talked about before, uh, where you put peptides on, on glass and then you put serum over it and see what antibodies are binding to the peptides. None of them had antibodies to HPV2 or 4 uh, in that assay. So they didn't actually, they didn't like the results, so they did a different assay uh, to detect antiviral antibodies. And there they found um, antibodies to different papillomavirus serotypes. And so they say the patients are clearly exposed to different HPV subsites. They develop long-lasting antibody responses. However, P3 had no anti-HPV4 antibodies, even though that patient P3 was infected for many years. So there was clearly a suboptimal antibody response in that patient. Um, so um, possi I guess in part because of the, the CD28 deficiency, right, Brianne? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, no response in other than HPV6 and 11 in P1 who was already seropositive for these subtypes before vaccination. Oh, I'm sorry. So then they tested a T cell dependent vaccine response uh, of the patients to HPV vaccine and DPT vaccine, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccine. Um, other than HPV 6 and 11 in patient 1 who was already seropositive, no response in P1 and a weak response in P3 to these vaccinations. No response to tetanus toxin in any of the three patients, even five months after boost. So... Basically, they find the CD28 deficient patients respond poorly to vaccination, but they do generate a 
T cell dependent and independent IgG responses to other pathogens, including uh, HPV. So T cell dependent and independent, it works. So that's why they think the patients don't suffer from uh, any of the many clinical manifestations of inborn errors of B cell and antibody immunity, recurrent infections of respiratory and uh, digestive tracts. So once again, I want to probe Brianne's head mm -hmm. uh, because I'm asking myself, I, I have a hard time. This is a lot of stuff. I have a hard time it is. keeping it all together. Um, but this to me somehow speaks to uh, what CD28 actually does, okay? Right. Uh, as opposed to, say, other, we've already talked about, Signal 2 mm -hmm. uh, is probably, there are a number of different things that yes, can do Signal 2. So there are redundancies that um, uh, uh, cover for CD28, but what's CD28 doing? So it looks like CD28... Um, is particularly important for um, activating the uh, T cell response um, that is dealing with these herpes virus, or the, not herpes viruses, papilloma viruses. Yeah. Um, and also DPT, right? And, and DPT. And so some of it, so it seems to be pretty specific to the CD4 cells that are helping to respond to these viruses. Um, as well as DPT, whether that is it, in the virus case because the virus is modifying any other co-stim molecules, so this is the only one that's left, or whether this is getting at sort of a kind of unique type of C4 stimulation is not really clear. And I think that that's something somebody could look at in the future. Yeah, because I started out thinking, you know, that this was pathogen specific somehow, and yet the no. the lack of response <laughs> to the vaccines indicate that that's not really the case. It's sort of, it's 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 mm, it's describing a pathway in a way. Right. Exactly. And I think that this says to me that oh, these particular responses might group together as a pathway. Yeah. And now we can try to figure out what it is about them. What, what is the pathway? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay good. So th this is not a deficiency in response to HPVs, but certain HPVs only. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. right. That's really curious, isn't it? It, it is. And it, whenever I read papers from this group, that is often what you see. Is that it's sort of it's the, some kind of um, deficiency in response to some very specific microbes, um, highlighting a gene in humans that we wouldn't, you know, that I would sometimes never say, oh, I would expect that gene would definitely be important for that pathogen. Like the, the connections are not always super clear, um, I, and that's it's just fascinating to both see the redundancy but also see where it breaks down. So one of the things I'm thinking about here is that one of the interesting things about the HPVs is that the different HPVs are uh, very tissue specific. I mean, you have some that are just the soles of your feet, okay? That's right. That's and you right. have others that are just your, your hands, others that are just your genitalia. And I wonder if there are... Um, uh, sort of anatomical differences in pathways. I wonder if that's what we're doing here. There, that could make a lot of sense. Um, I could imagine there being anatomical differences in pathways. Um, I can't tell you how DPT would fall yeah. into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something um, there, though, clearly, right? But um, I, that makes a lot of sense to me, that this is a something about what kind of co-stem do you need in what anatomic location. Right. Or route of entry of a pathogen or something like that. Sure. Okay. So the key, the, the moral of this is just because it's a different, it, a different serotype can have substantial differences. It's not just an antigenic difference. Like polio one, two, three, they might have other properties aside from antigenicity that are different. Tell um, me something, Brianne. Are dendritic cells the same everywhere? Or are there no. region-specific dendritic cells? Yeah. Okay. Oh, my God. Fine. <laughs> okay. So many, so many different kinds. All right. Yeah. Great. The, the answer to dendritic cells is heterogeneity. Okay. 
So that these patients have no antibodies to HPV 4 and 2, which are the two HPVs that seem to be causing a problem in them, right? Right. right. All right, so then they said, what about T cell responses to viral peptides? Remember, we've had Alessandro Setteani talks about how you can make overlapping peptides for a viral protein, and then you throw the peptides in a T cell culture and see if they... Uh, respond, get activated by the peptides, and then you measure that by the production of certain cytokines, right, as a measure of them recognizing a peptide. So that's what they do here. They have peptides from HPV 2 and 4, and they take T cells out of these patients, put them in culture, and they throw the peptides in and look for uh, cytokine production. No, but they looked at IL-4, 2, and 17A, no production in response to peptides. Uh, but they do ch use uh, human cytomegalovirus peptides uh, where they do get responses. Um, the controls cells all make T cell responses to these HPV2 and 4 peptides. Um, so basically their, con their conclusion is the <clears throat> T cell, and, and they only, wait a minute, I missed something here. That was, uh, so they looked at both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Are they together in the same culture, Brianne? I guess so, right? Um, I think they are together in the same culture. Yeah, they should be. But they could distinguish the two? Yeah, because you're doing all of this by flow cytometry. Um, you're measuring yeah. the cytokine production by flow cytometry. So you can have, you can look at the CD4s and CD8 separately. So they found a clear CD4 T cell response in their controls, but no CD8 T cell response in the controls or the patients for any of these HPV peptides. So they conclude that anti-HPV uh, T cell responses are only found in CD4 positive T cells and that despite prolonged exposure to these HPV2 and 4, P1 and P2 didn't make T cell responses to them and P1's mother who sells express CD28 do respond to those peptides. So they're thinking this uh, this failure to have a T cell response to HPV and 4 is part of their issue, right? Mm -hmm. And in Very particular they're they're you know highlighting the CD4 defect. Right. Um then they ask um they look at the ligands of CD28 in skin biopsy. Uh, they look at expression of CD28, CD80, and 86. What's 80 and 86, Brian? Uh, CD80 and 86 are the two different ligands of For CD28. CD28. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in skin biopsy specimens from the patients, they found <clears throat> the lymphocytic infiltrate in the dermis below the lesions, so underneath the lesions, have no CD28 expression. And so they say, you know, these few revertant cells that we found they don't end up there. Which makes sense. The likelihood of them being positive for yeah. viral antigen is, you know, very, very low. No CD80 and 86 on HPV infected keratinocytes within the lesion. Uh, so the conclusion here, the lesions are more likely to result from impaired interactions between T cells and antigen presenting cells in the epidermis, dermis, or draining lymph nodes. I'm not sure I get that. So it's not as if these cells are, these keratinocytes are trying to give signal to, to the T cells and the T cells aren't responding. There's no mm -hmm. signal to being made here. The problem with the signal to is happening somewhere else. But they also say that the infected Keratinocytes don't ex don't express the CD28 ligands, right? Right. So, so remember how Rich was talking about the warts and the different layers? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so basically, this is sort of saying that the the original signal two issue is not happening in this layer. It was in a different layer. Okay. You got that, Rich? Yeah, we're good. Uh, histology of the lesions is not typical of papillomas. All right, so, so far we have CD28 deficiency, 
explains why these patients are susceptible to this disease, but they have different phenotypes, right? Patient one has, has tree man syndrome and patients two and three have severe warts. So they say maybe you need a persistent infection of HPV2 because they did find HPV2 in all the TMS patients that have been tested. They're not that many, but they all have uh, some HPV2. Um, so they, they look at that, but um, they don't find productive infection. Uh, and in fact, they say they, they say HPV2 infection may be non-productive in the lesions of patient one, which they also say is, is happening in the rabbits, non-productive infection in rabbits and certain uh, neoplasias associated with HPVs in humans. The, the, uh, uh, it, for me, the bottom line is that the lesions in pa uh, patient one look for all the world like what you find in a cervical carcinoma. Right. Except that the DNA, as they show, the viral DNA is not integrated, which it, it's not always in cervical mm -hmm. uh, carcinomas. It exists as an episome, but there's no virus being made or anything like that. You're just getting yeah. Yeah. this uh, uh, hyper proliferation that we talked about. Okay. And um, you're not getting uh, capsid protein made. Uh, you're not uh, seeing uh, appropriate. Uh, regulation in the uh, different tissues. It's, uh, this is like a, a bona fide transformation event. Benign, but transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they did sequence the genome, whole genome sequencing now, um, and they don't find insertion of HPV2 into the genome, as you said. Uh, so they're thinking that episomal and non-productive infections drive the, these benign lesions, which is the case for other HPVs. Um, they also find a viral protein made, which they say may be indicating that some areas of the lesions are productive. They're making virus, actually, which maybe is how it spreads in the patient. Um, they don't find it in the blood, but, you know, it could be spreading in the tissues, I suppose. Uh, and finally, the last uh, data, they look at uh, viral gene expression. Um, you know, this, this virus encodes transcripts for the capsid proteins, L1 and L2, and then the oncogenes, the so-called oncogenes, which drive the cells to divide. I mentioned earlier E6 and E7. They find those present uh, in, the, in, in these uh, lesions. Uh, strongly expressed, overexpressed in the basal and parabasal la layers of the uh, epidermis. So there's this spatiotemporal uh, character for their expression, as, as Rich was talking about earlier in the different layers of the skin. Um, so those, that makes sense because E6 and E7, E6 and E7 are the oncogenes that cause the induction of tumors. And so they say this is a slowly spreading multifocal benign epithelial tumor driven by an episomal HPV2 it doesn't have the capsid transcripts. Those have probably been lost, so it doesn't make virus particles. But E6 and E7 are overproduced in certain parts of the skin, uh, and that, in the presence of CD8 deficiency, impairs the clearance of infected cells, which would otherwise happen by the T cells. Right. CD28 deficiency, not yeah, CD8. CD20. I seem to want to say CD8 all the time. <laughs> I want to drop that too, right? But there's, uh, as I understood it, correct me if I'm wrong, there's nothing particularly unusual about the HPV2 that this guy has. Nope, nothing unusual. It's his, it's his In fact, it's typical. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that this is an unanswered question in the paper. Why patient one has this nasty problem with, I mean, they all basically have the same, well, with respect to CD28, same genotype. Okay, but why patient one has this nasty problem with HPV two, and the other two patients right. uh, have HPV four that at least uh, at this point doesn't look nearly as nasty, and I don't. That's an unresolved question, if I understand it correctly. Well, I guess it could be dependent on the serotype, right, or the genotype of the HPV. It, it could be dependent on the genotype of the HPV. Um, I could also imagine that there could be other things going on. Um, 
my first question is, you know, what's going on with these patients in terms of their HLA types and their CD8 responses? Um, since most of this is thinking about uh, CD4. So, and part of the reason why I uh, think about that, and I, I, you know, did a PhD on CD8 T cells. So my brain goes to those first. This could be other immune cells like NK cells too. Um, but it, it stood out to me when we looked at the details of patient two, um, that the patient two had um, the warts spreading. And then at age uh, 20 years, the warts suddenly um, started to regress without intervention. And then they disappeared within two years. And so I wonder if there was something different going on in terms of immune response to this virus um, in patient two and potentially his daughter, patient three. Yeah. So they say in the discussion that these are the first CD28 deficient humans that have been described. Okay. And that they are highly susceptible to HPV two and four, but otherwise healthy, which I, I still find really, really amazing. Right. Right, exactly. I wonder if these cousins interact with each other. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm i wondering what would, uh, th this is, pardon me, but I'm wondering what would happen if P2 picked up some HPV2 from P1. I don't really want to do that experiment. No, I mean, I you you might assume that they probably interact at least enough that whoever was described first, I assume P1, um, they could say, oh, I have a family member who also has something going on with with warts. You know, so they, they at least know each other yeah. <laughs> in order to probably uh, be diagnosed by similar clinicians. But as far as whether they know each other enough that viruses could transmit between them is not clear. So the other thing I want to point out, they... Remember, they said E6 and 7 are overproduced. These are oncogenes, right? They're overproduced. And they say the overproduction is limited to the basal layer of the epidermis. To our knowledge, such a pattern of deregulation has never been reported before and may account for the giant cutaneous horns in the patients. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, so... So to me, you know, the, the CD28 deficiency story here is was really interesting because they point out, you know, that these are the first CD28 deficient patients shown. Um, so, you know, before this, you could say, well, we have never found a person who is deficient in CD28. Mm. And you could take that to mean two different things. One, if you are deficient in CD28, you don't live because you get such severe issues that you die yeah. or if you are deficient in CD28, you, we don't notice and we've never found you. Um, yeah, and man. until you find the, those patients, you can't actually say, is it that that deficiency is incompatible with life or is it, which would make you think, Oh, it's really severe or here. Hey, it's these patients who are, seemingly fine except for this one particular susceptibility. And so that makes me think that uh, this is either way. Uh, it could be that uh, these patients are noticeable or have their particular phenotype because it's a CD8 deficiency in a particular context. Mm. Okay. The uh, other things that we don't know about. Okay. That, yeah. that manifest in this fashion. Though the linkage yeah. analysis, you know, showed up CD28, this is it, don't look anywhere else. <laughs> uh, so, Brianne, if you, if you took T-cells from this patient one, put them in culture, transduce them with a lentiviral producing CD28, that should take care of his lesions, right? Um, in other words, do gene therapy. I think you'd have to find his T cells that responded to the papillomavirus antigen. Well, could you just take all his T? You just take a pool of T cells. Wouldn't that include them? Uh, if you took a large enough pool. Yeah, Vincent's doing a bone marrow transplant. <laughs> 
That's what he's doing. How how many would you need, uh, Brianne? <laughs> would you need like ten million or or one million or what? Do you have any idea? Uh, I'm tr- I do not remember the precursor frequency. I think ten million might work, but I don't remember. How much I can have- you get from blood easily? Do you know? Um, you're making me go way back. I'm just wondering if it's <laughs> feasible or not. You know? Yeah, I think I think you maybe could get that many out of blood. I have not done experiments like this enough to know. Okay. All right. So, but unfortunately it's only one person. So they're not going to develop a gene therapy for that one person, right? Probably not. I hope they can do something for him. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, we know the defect, right? So it would be good if you could, but no company's going to do that because it costs too much money to do the trialing and all that. They also say it would be interesting to make CD8, CD28 deficient rabbits and see if you get horns on them <laughs> when you infect them. I wonder if the rabbits in the wild that have the horns are, are CD28, CD28 deficient. deficient. Maybe. Because nobody's looked, I'm sure. We have to capture a jackalope. <laughs> 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 wow. Um so just to end up here, it turns, so they say there are many inherited T-cell deficits that underlie severe common warts, severe common warts, not the kind where you just have one or two, you know. I, when I was a kid, I had warts on my fingers. I remember at just for like a year and then they disappeared and I've never had any since. Yep. That's, I just thought of that when I was reading this paper the other day. They were like for a year, they were there. And I remember my mother used to say, stop biting your fingers. They'll go away. And I, they went away. <laughs> yeah, I went through, I had my warty phase. It wasn't too warty. It was a little warty. Um, so anyway, it's in, they say, um, it's intriguing that CD28 deficiency underlies a selective susceptibility to common warts caused by alpha and gamma HPVs in otherwise healthy individuals through an exclusive and specific impairment of T-cell adaptive immunity, which is really rare. It's interesting. Brian, why do you think these CD28 deficiencies are so rare? Because otherwise there would be a problem in people? Uh, I guess so. I mean, part of it is, I don't know how, we don't know how rare, I guess, they are. Hmm. We, we, it's rare that we see someone with a phenotype and can tie that phenotype back to a CD28 deficiency. Um, but in many of us, I guess we don't know if we have a CD28 deficiency or not, or a CD28 polymorphism, because our other signal two proteins are redundantly helping us turn on T cells. Yeah. No, and it's reason- only when this mystery pathway is involved that we have this issue. The reason I ask is because they say in the beginning that if you look in the public databases, right, there are f- right. four gene, human genome databases. They only find five homozygous missense variants, right? So a missense would just change the amino acid, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, which is what we have here. Homozygous are only five. So, you know, it, it's not everyone's genome, but it's pretty rare. It's probably an indication, you know, if that's 10% of the world's population in those genomes, then you can extrapolate. There would be more, I guess. Maybe we only see it in these patients because they still can make a little bit of CD28. Um, so even in the, if you remember if, at the beginning, uh, when they looked at the cells with the mutation, there still was a little bit of residual CD28 mRNA being made. Mm-hmm. And so all of these patients are making a teeny bit of CD28 protein, just not the normal amount. And so maybe if you make zero, then it is very severe Mm -hmm. and you can't survive. But here you can just make a little bit um, because you have a small amount of the correct splice form being made. And that little bit is enough in every case except this. But mice are fine uh, without any of the gene, without CD28. Of course, that's not humans, but... right. Uh, apparently, mice can live without it. What do you th- what do you think of this observation that in mice the CD twenty eight null 
they, they have very low antibody levels, but these patients have reasonable antibody levels. Do you think that's because they're making a little bit of CD28 maybe? It could be because they're making a little bit of CD28. I know there are some other places where um, immunodeficiencies of exact antibody amounts, um, I'm thinking of certain types of skid are different between mouse and human as well. I, I just found this fascinating. I, yeah. Yeah. It's great know, stuff. It's just so cool and it's it's subtle and we still don't really understand what's going on. I mean, the big thing for me is why HPV 2 and 4? And we talked about that a little. I think that's just fascinating. I mean, this system didn't evolve just for for HPV 2 and 4, right? Right. <laughs> no, it's doing other stuff and we will hear more stuff. about it. This is a case where I'd love to have that first author, Vivian, on to talk about it. Wouldn't that have been something? That would have been yeah, very cool. Yeah, because she's obviously thought about all these questions. So uh, with respect to what you were just talking about, about residual CD28, the mice that they made, not that no. mice tell the truth, they were null mice. No, that's right. Yeah. They're null. Yeah, they're yeah. null. And they are okay, yeah. Um, but maybe they have different redundancies, yeah. right? They're, no. Wow, that took a while. <laughs> I hope you folks got it, or at least got a semblance of why we, we think it's cool. So it is time to uh, move on to some picks of the week. Uh, Brianne, what do you have for us? <laughs> um, so I have um, a New York Times article uh, that came across uh, my feed, I guess, uh, recently. And I really couldn't believe it. Um, I guess when I thought about it more, I could make sense of it. But at the beginning, I was like very surprised, um, which is called Every Pore on Your Face is a Walled Garden. Um, and um, this is discussing a paper that came out recently in Cell Host and Microbe, um, looking at um, some bacteria in the pores of uh, of an individual and um, they looked at, I think it was 16 individuals. They looked at their face. They looked at some other body parts as well. They looked at the back um, and they saw sort of great diversity of um, this microbe, uh, Cutibacterium acnes. If they looked at say the person's face or if they looked at people in general, but when they actually got to the level of looking at individual pores, they found that each pore had only one variant. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and so it was as if each pore was kind of its own separate ecosystem with just <laughs> one version of this microbe. Um, and so while they had, you know, many, while a person will be colonized with many varieties, um, each pore is um, composed of just a single type of the microbe. Very cool. And I just thought that was so interesting. Vince's, so what do they Vince think is, is, is notes here. what do they think? <laughs> I'm going to do this on TWIM. Yeah, this is a TWIM yeah. paper. What do they think is is happening? Do Is it because each pore gets gets just one bacterium and therefore it's all clonal, right? And it excludes others or? So, yeah. So what they, they mentioned is that um, it's because each pore is so deep and narrow and so it's, they say that they think it's unlikely that um, more than one individual would get in there. And so one individual would get in there and you'd have kind of clonal um, replication. Um, yeah. And okay. then the immune system would kind of kill that one and you'd have just that one open um, pore for one microbe to get down into. Um, and they also, it looks like um, in each case, they think that the founder out, had always gotten there only about a year before. Hmm. Um, so there's a fair amount of turnover. Um, but yeah, so they, they talk about what's the diversity in one square centimeter of your face, but then within one pore, there's a complete lack of diversity. So I, I don't know anything about pores. Um, are they always uh, arising and going away? Do you know? I don't think so. I think they're always there. So you're born with them and then... I think so. But your skin, but gets, not... your skin gets bigger, so there must be some <laughs> multiplication <Yeah>. of pores. <laughs> I don't know anything about pores. I don't really know much about pores either. 
the even the thought of them being deep and narrow um, was sort of new to me as I was reading all of this. Pores. I'd never thought of pores, <laughs> but I just, I just wonder if they turn because you can imagine if new ones arise. Right. Then, then they get a single bacterium, maybe, because of a structural thing, as you're saying. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this is a twin paper. Very cool. Veronique Greenwood. That sounds familiar. I don't know why. Huh. That's cool. Thank you, Brianne. No problem. I thought it was really fascinating. It's very cool. <laughs> Bring, raises a lot of questions. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, this is a repick that dates back to 2011. TWIV 126, which was titled <laughs> Warts Up, Doc, uh, with <laughs> Michelle Osmond. <laughs> and I picked this essay by Lewis Thomas called On Warts. And I thought that would be appropriate for this. Listeners, I'm sure that most listeners have not been around since 2011. Uh, Lewis Thomas was a uh, quite a famous uh, scientist, uh, 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 quite an accomplished MD. He was... Um, well, he was president of Sloan Kettering for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. And he al right. was also an essayist uh, and has uh, a number of uh, essay collections. This particular uh, essay is from a book called The Medusa and the Snail. Uh, and I highly recommend the whole book, but I've linked to a PDF uh, for this uh, essay that's called On Warts. And what it is, is that he riffs on an observation. Uh, I, he says that there are clinical studies. And I mean, he's, you know, he buys it apparently. Uh, clinical studies that say that you can r get rid of warts by hypnosis. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> but what's the role of CD28 in hypnosis? I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, apparently there are old experiments that do this. There are even experiments where the hypnotist tells you to get rid of the warts on half of your body. Uh, and that works. And some people get confused and, and, uh, and get rid of it warts on the wrong half. He talks about how doctors, uh, you know, uh, old time doctors would, uh, often essentially do this by, you know, uh, somebody would come in with warts and they'd paint them with gentian violet, which does nothing, okay? And they'd say, oh, your warts will go away. This will take care of it. And the warts would go away, okay? Um, so whether or not you believe that, uh, and I'd love to see some uh, newer experiments with it, the essay is uh, just hilarious and really good. Um, uh, he says... If my unconscious can figure out how to manipulate the mechanisms needed for getting rid, getting around that virus and for deploying all the various cell types in the correct order for tissue rejection, then all I have to say is my unconscious is a lot further along than I am. <laughs> he's a great writer. Uh, yeah, he, he's great. He was a great writer. And, and this um, goes on and on with that kind of humor. It's just wonderful. So it's an says, essay not only about... Uh, warts, but about his reflections on what the unconscious is. And you've seen how we struggled over this paper, trying to uh, uh, figure out the immunology. And he's saying is if his unconscious can manipulate his immunology in this way, that his unconscious is a world-class cell biologist. <laughs> Rich, in, in the uh, cells of a wart, do, do they contain infectious HPV? They contain HPV DNA, yeah. But not infectious particles. Uh, the in the upper layers. So so what yeah, happens? The, oh, the is ones that, that fall off. Right? What happens? Okay. So the epidermis, okay, uh, uh, yes. has a has a basal layer of cells that are essentially stem cells uh, that divide, and uh, some fraction of them stay as stem cells in the basal layer, and some fraction uh, migrate into upper layers. And as they move up in the epidermis, go through several stages of, uh, differentiation to ultimately result in keratinocytes at the top. And then these, uh, you know, dead cells that give us, uh, the protection against, um, uh, invaders. Um, and I've seen, uh, who is it? Tom Broker, 
uh, who uh, has studied a lot of this, uh, uh, has uh, I've seen pictures from his lab where they've done in situ hybridizations for uh, different keratins in mm-hmm. cross sections of epidermis because the differentiation involves making different keratins at different stages in the differentiation. And there are these really well-defined layers in the epidermis uh, where the different uh, keratins are made. And at any rate, what happens is that the virus uh, initially, somehow, either through a wound or otherwise, gets into the uh, uh, basal cells, the stem cells, mm-hmm. um, and the DNA stays there as an episome and replicates at a low level and makes these uh, early gene products that uh, do replication and also stimulate the cell proliferation. And then mm-hmm. as the cells, as the these infected cells, they don't make any mature virus, but as they right. migrate up, the differentiation signals in the epidermis trigger different patterns of gene expression in the virus to right. ultimately, when you get to the top of the uh, epidermis, trigger the late gene expression. So it's in the upper layers of the wart right. Uh, right. that you get uh, mature particle production, and the, which is right. then shed off in the keratinocytes, which is right. why you can't ordinarily grow the virus in culture because you need that whole differentiation thing. Right. You need to create a raft culture. Right. Uh, in culture where you right. reproduce that whole epidermis and then you can uh, do the virus replication. And the, Fascinating story. The idea that the virus particles are not made till the end makes perfect sense because then those are shed and that's how you infect other people, Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and this is what I was saying earlier is that in my sort of naive um, uh, perspective on things, it makes sense to me that it's a T-cell response that you need to get rid of all of those cells that are not really making a virus, but are making vi- early viral gene products, okay, yeah, that yeah. Uh, cause the cells to proliferate. Especially because that cell at the end that maybe is finally making viral particles is, you know, going to be more like a dead cell. Yeah, because yeah. It's getting to be yeah. at the edge of the skin. And so... You know, and there's you, no you basically keep the cell alive until you don't need it anymore. And those <laughs> and then, dead cells, the dead skin, there are no T cells in there anyway, right? Because it's dead. Right. Yep. So, um, the but the underlying cells should be targets of T cells because they're going to display peptides, viral peptides, right? Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. right. And so that probably is what eventually gets rid of the wart in an immunocompetent person. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so the the um, he, he writes, in a certain sense, warts are both useful and essential, but not for us. As it turns out, the exuberant cells of a wart are the elaborate re- reproductive apparatus of a virus. Which is right. It's true. Yeah, his writing is just uh, enormously entertaining. You know, the word wart is unfortunate, isn't it? It's, just, <laughs> it's not a nice word, right? <laughs> I mean, I know the wart is not a good thing, and especially in these patients with lots of them but the word is just wart <laughs> it sounds like as bad as it is oh that's great um gosh that was so long ago warts up doc <laughs> <laughs> i wonder who made that title uh could have been alan i don't know was he on the alan. he was on the show yeah that's right was, he was uh, on before uh you, you dixon alan me and michelle osmond Wow. That's cool. Uh, Perfect choice. You remembered that, right, for this uh, episode? Uh, Well, I didn't, uh, you know, I was looking, I was going through my picks and that kind of stuff, and then it just popped into my mind. Because the teaching the papillomavirus stuff was a passion for me. Because my um, sister-in-law died of a cervical carcinoma at the age of 34, Mm -hmm. and she was my, for 20 five years at UF, she was my uh, medical case for right. teaching uh, papillomaviruses uh, to the medical students. And it's uh, fascinating because at the, you know, when I started doing that, that was in 1990, there mm-hmm. were still some people who were not convinced of uh, viral etiology for cervical carcinoma. Um, and since that time, uh, not only did we figure out there was a viral etiology, but that certain subtypes did it so that you could actually do a diagnosis to figure out your the, the virus type risk factors for whether an infection would lead to a cervical carcinoma to ultimately mm-hmm. a vaccine. I mean, it's incredible. Um, 
at any rate, I used to, uh, uh, one of my references in that lecture was this essay. Okay. So it's been in my mind for years. So it popped in there again as we were doing this. Harold Zuerhausen. Mm. He's Nobel the guy Price. who made the connection between HPVs and cancer. I interviewed him a number of years oh, ago. Oh, that's He's right. You did. I don't think I've listened a, to that. I have to put a link to that in. Mm -hmm. um, I, my pick is a, um, a another gift from uh, one of our children um, for the holidays. Uh, I, I picked one. My daughter gave me the DNA history book that I picked last week. Uh, this one is called Cells at Work Code Black. So uh, our, our son Devin gave me Cells at Work a number of years ago. And this is a manga, right? It's a Japanese co a comic book where you read from the back to the front. <laughs> and that original uh, Cells at Work was all about the cells in your body and what they're doing and the different... Human characters were different cells, red blood cells, lymphocytes, et cetera. And it was really good. And he gave me now, there's a new series called Cells at Work, Code Black, um, which he said is, is more of like adult because there's a lot of gore and blood and so forth in it than the original one. But they say on the, this new spinoff... Um, a newbie red blood cell is one of the 37 trillion working to keep this body running, but something's wrong. Stress hormones keep yelling at them to go faster. The blood vessels are crusted over with cholesterol, ulcer, fatty liver, trouble downstairs. It's hard for a cell to keep working when every day is a code black. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me volumes one, two, and three of wow. Cells at Work Code <clears throat> wow. Black. I think cool. it's great. Um, and the, the original series is very good also. I have... Uh, some of the, he gave me the original one, and and uh, that's fun. I've read that. We well, can read these very quickly because they're mostly comics with not a lot of words, right? But it's great. It's great for you know a lot of people love manga, and it's a good way to get a little science in there. So check it out. Uh, we have a couple of listener picks. Chris writes, "Greetings, epitopes. I would like to thank you for the great podcast." that I've been listening to since around 2014. I tried out a few science podcasts and Twib's the only one that has lasted because you are all the real deal. <laughs> I even went back to the beginning but could not get the first 50 at the time. Um, by the way, on your phone, yeah, you can't get, you can only get the last 100. There's some limitation of what we're doing, but if you go to the website, you can get them all, okay? So something we have to fix one day. Uh, it has helped inoculate me against misinformation and the peddlers of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt to trust the process of developing vaccines that will end the pandemic. I would like to re recommend Ria Lina as a guest to discuss communicating with the vaccine hesitant. She has a BSc in experimental pathology, an MSc in forensic science, and a PhD in virology. My listener pick is the episode of the Guilty Feminist podcast that featured Rhea, 279, Myths with Catherine Bohart and special guests Rhea Lena and Rachel Sermani. Longshot is a fantastic podcast series detailing the over 5,000-year run-up that enabled the vaccines to be developed so quickly and become an overnight success. At the end of one episode, someone called Alan Dove is thanked. Any idea who that might be? <laughs> Keep banging the rocks together. And uh, Chris gives links to these things that he's talked about. Cool. Do you know anyone know this podcast? I've not heard no. of it. I have not, but it sounds like a one I want to listen to. Now, there are two podcasts here. There's the Guilty Feminist podcast, or maybe that's one episode. Okay. Yeah, so that's one episode. And Longshot is the entire podcast, right? That's a separate podcast, and it's... That's the 5,000 year run up. The other one is just this person who does the communication. Okay. And then Duncan writes this seems to be an animal that biologically adopts chloroplast. The Wikipedia link is good too and provides a link to <clears throat> a um, Science Line article Meet the Green Kleptos of the Animal Kingdom. 
um, also called the Eastern Emerald Elysia. It's a bright green sea slug about the size of a lemon. Oh, I guess it's got chloroplasts. It steals chloroplasts. Interesting. Not clear how sea slugs manage to photosynthesize after snatching the chloroplasts. Um, it, uh, I guess it must eat plants and then it, it incorporates them into its cells. Wow. Yeah, I remember <laughs> there was a pic about that. I the, seen her, about yeah, some I seen her organism some, yeah. doing something like that in the past. Wow, it's cool. Who would have known? It's just amazing. Science is amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for your amazing work producing Twix, where X stands for one, two, multiple letters. And I love your virology course online. I can't believe all you do. I'm very grateful. Thanks for showing what real science is like. Well, glad you like it, Duncan. We really appreciate it. All right, that'll do it for TWIV 852. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us your questions, comments, pics, twiv at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to support us, we are now a 501c3, which means your deductions are tax deductible. Uh, for the rest of January, if you go over to parasiteswithoutborders.com, uh, that is Daniel Griffin's um, 501c3. If you donate there, he will match your donation and give it back to Microbe TV. So take your choice. If you like what we do, consider it. Or you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Get vaccinated. Brian Barker is a Drew University bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. And for the immunologists listening, I fact-checked myself. I know the Nobel Prize was CTLA-4 and not CD28, but they're related. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah, you would have gotten mail, right? Yeah. I thought of it right after I said it. CTLA-4, right. Yeah, but that's related to CD28. Okay. So. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>